One of the other really important topics that's been consistent through the event so far and all of this week is around participation and community engagement. And I'm really pleased that our next speaker, uh, Veronica Costarelli, if I pronounce your name correctly, is going to talk to us about mainstreaming cultural heritage uh, when engaging in community engagement. So, Veronica, are you there? Yes, Amir, can you hear me? We can hear you fine. So I'm going to give you the Thank microphone. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to try to also screen, share my screen. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much for this opportunity. So to, my name is Veronica Costarelli, you said correctly, Charlie, and uh, as you can tell, I'm Italian. So today we are going to talk about a very important topic for me, which is the importance of mainstreaming cultural heritage in community engagement. I have done this um, presentation also in collaboration with ICROM. It is an international center for the study of the preservation and restoration of cultural property. So basically it's an intergovernmental organization that has been working with its uh, member states to promote the conservation of all form of cultural heritage and also engaging different professionals all around the world. For us it is very relevant because they have been working a lot in disaster risk mitigation and first response to cultural heritage. And they launched actually last year one of the first first I eat to cultural heritage in times of crisis training course that I had the pleasure to attend. And together we have also launched a small project, which is the role of humanitarian and cultural heritage in emergency response. And TAO actually is the project trying to demonstrate the integration of cultural heritage first aid and also with humanitarian work and how much actually this can be, give a meaningful contribution in alleviating all the suffering of people. And so, before starting with my the presentation and especially before talking about how we can actually mainstream in cultural heritage in our community engagement, I believe it will be very important for me to work through a little bit through the terminology that we are going to use because I know that perhaps not everybody might be very familiar with this terminology. First of all is what does heritage mean? Well, uh, literally is a property that may be inherited, but also it could be a special or individual possession. According to UNESCO definition, heritage is the legacy that we receive from the past, we experience in our present, and then we pass on to future generation. It can be also related to historically monument or collection of object, but it's also there is a lot to do with uh, live expression, our oral tradition, uh, ritual, celebration, practices. And in fact, when we're talking about heritage, it can be a picture, a document, a whole Buddha, everything can be related to cultural heritage. For us, it is very important uh, to define two types of heritage. We have the tangible heritage versus the intangible heritage. When we talk about tangible heritage, we're talking about historical monuments, religious monuments, archaeological sites. And then when we actually talk about intangible heritage, it's mostly related to traditional skills, craft, ritual and cultural practices, the knowledge that we pass to future generations, but also can relate it to natural landscape. And so why we are talking about cultural heritage? Well, first of all, we are talking about, we are working a lot with the community. And there is a, something that it is very important for us to understand that there is values that are associated to cultural heritage. And uh, basically people are giving like meaning and value to specific heritage that whether it is a collection or a landscape or archeological site. And also, and these value are basically are the base for the legitimation of the identity of the people. And so the heritage protection and management became very valuable also for the work I believe that humanitarians are doing in the field. And also the value are drawn from association and memory of the past event. So there is always a continuation. 
And so just to give an example, like when we're talking about a value, what actually we mean is that a specific object, a object can have an artistic value, but also social and spiritual value, historical value, educational value, and also environmental value. And, and so when actually there are disaster, actually natural calamities and conflict, what are these impact on the cultural heritage? Well, first of all, we have the loss of knowledge. Community are dispersed, and so there is the, this prevented transmission also, or the continuation of cultural practices. You also, the local structure might not be there anymore. And so this is also the cultural transmission can become a low priority. There is not an intergenerational transmission. For example, when we're talking about immigration, for example, migrants might not moving together with a, with a group, with a society. And so they might be quite left alone also in the, in the way how they're performing the art. When in reality, in the place of origin, they're performing a specific art in a collectivity. But also we have the loss of the site. So you also practice specific cultural heritage or cultural activities linked to specific site. And perhaps the site are not there anymore. There is the loss of tools, loss of record, lack of raw material, and all this huge impact on the value that associated with the cultural heritage, it also can provoke the, what we call it the crisis of identity. That for example, we can see in our work on a specific targeted group, for example, when we have worked with the Rohingya. And so how can we assess the effect of disaster or conflict on cultural heritage? I believe that we are working, as we said before, come management put the community at the center of our intervention. And so always working with the community, we can actually try to assess this impact and identify these three steps that we can take also in our activities, while we are actually implementing activities in the camps or in the out of camp setting. First of all, you know, something that we are doing is, uh, is something not different from what we're doing is identify the affected community. Talking, uh, using basically the camp management language, population data. We have information about the population data, about gender, age breakdown, ethnicity, religion, place of origin. And that is the first step. The second step is identify what we call it the cultural brokers basically is our community leaders. When you already have a social structure in place, identify what is this social structure, who is actually performing cultural practices or art. So you have elderly community leaders, elected leaders. You might have religious leaders, also women's group, men's group, performance. And then you can engage with them in the way how we already engaging with the community in our camp through focus group discussion, meeting, survey, conversations. The third, and this is we are going into the cultural heritage assessment, is we need to, we need to engage with these cultural brokers in order to understand what is community concern about. For example, is there having this disruption of oral expression? For example, they cannot perform in their heart anymore, or the social practices, or the ritual, or festival, or local knowledge, or specific tradition, for example. What are the main things that are really concerned that they cannot carry on because of the conflict or after, because of the aftermath of conflict? And once you identify the concern, then you need to do a, another step, which is, first of all, document the tangible heritage that are associated with this. So for just to give you an example, here we listed the place of worship, historic archaeological monument, community places. For example, when you have a community that is displaced, while they are displaced, for example, in informal site, they might occupy place of worship that are quite actually valuable for people, for the host community. And so in order to don't create some friction between the community, it's very important to identify this potential crash ahead of time and also like doing this small assessment. 
And once we identify all these tangible sites that are associated with their cultural practices, what we need to do is actually assess the status of the tradition and esti estimate the extent of the change that are brought by the disaster and the, this um, extent if the, actually this change might be continuing over time. So is the community able to continue its practices? As the transmission of knowledge and skills have completely stopped because of the, of the war conflict, as the community be faced any threat or risk of performing this act, especially this is related to minor groups. And is there any vulnerable group in need of major support in performing these cultural practices and continue their tradition? This will also give you the base for the next step, which is securing and stabil stabilizing. The stabilization of community-based heritage means ensuring that a community can continue a specific practice, even in the aftermath of a hazard event, ensuring that the transmission of knowledge and skills can continue under a long term and solution can be identified. It also might involve documentation for visual or horror record for the future. And also, for example, it means for stabilizing the tangible heritage. It's also related to, we can support the community, for example, in restoring specific place of worship. We can support the in damage and risk assessment to this specific place of worship or where they perform specific tradition. And to be, to be very honest, like it gave me a lot of uh, knowledge of the course that I have done because we're struggling a lot in identifying activities to undertake with the community. And I believe that there is, uh, um, there are like activities that we're already doing with the community that we call it community engagement. But then when you talk to cultural experts, actually we are already doing some activities that are related to the preservation of their own, of their own heritage. And I believe we need to also acknowledge that this is, has been already ongoing but I think they should also be mainstream somehow because is uh, cultural heritage is not something that you put in a box, but is something that is, uh, is integrated because it's part of the community that we are serving. And there are a lot of key benefits of cultural heritage program in the post-conflict recovery. As we say, engaging the community is one of the most, I believe, very important aspect for us. But then you can also use the traditional knowledge to empower with skills for employment. For example, in Myanmar, uh, once the um, people were displaced, were related, were displaced in camps, we had a specific uh, um, a group of men that they were used to actually in fishing. That is part of the tradition, but they didn't have any more their, their tools. What we, do, what we did with our community engaged activities, we decided to provide the material for fishing net. And so the community restarted already to do some, basically the, the work that they've been doing before the displacement, in that sense, the were a continuation. And this is pretty much related also to inclusive development because you can also provide an impact um, at the scale by working with the government in integrating specific program. It can also have therapeutic intervention. For example, I know that IAM in Bangladesh have created what's called this open museum where people actually have been recording all the oral, oral tradition. Have also been trying to, I think through the use of painting, also remembering very important place of worship. And this, of course, is also related to social cohesion because, for example, you can also try to create a stronger link between the, um, the affected community and also the host community. And you can, with this, you can also give a voice to the people in need. We call it this also the potential memorial, memorialization in post-reconstruction. It's also related to reconciliation, recognition, promote also national identity. The way how nowadays the conflict has been ongoing, quite often you have people that are totally denigrated from their own culture or they've been quite targeted because of belongs into a specific uh, 
culture or tradition. Therefore, I believe it is very important to also preserve the memory and preserve their own identity. And you can, as I said before, like you have, you can engage with the societies, especially like in the, in the post-conflict recovering. Quite often we have, for example, development actors, they have been engaging in cultural heritage activities, but I believe that quite often we notice that there is always this, we don't have a, this uh, immediate step between emergency early recovering development, quite often we overlap with our activities. And it makes sense also trying to engage in those activities, considering that we have been working with the community. And just to give you like, we have uh, several examples that are collected around the world, in Myanmar, Uganda, Nigeria, for example, Nigeria, the put powerful potential of the music have been quite useful to dissipate inter-ethnic conflict in Syria, for the Syrian, for example, we have had the art therapy in a Zadari camp, theater, the performing art, or for example, in order to remember like the history of the prophet. Actually, I like one this slide because it's more colorful. And I remember also in, um, in Jordan, actually in another camp in Zadari, we identify, so Syrian were very well known about mosaic they were very good and we had actually one of these uh, important person that has been working mosaic for many years but as well it became unfortunate refugee and we decided to have uh, some mosaic course and we created like uh, also this mosaic around the camps and it was a very amazing like work that have been doing with uh, with the community as well as with arabic calligraphy this is like several projects that we have been implementing in, uh, in Myanmar. So from the fishing net for the also art craft with the bamboo stick. And then also we have the art therapy and youth engagement, especially in Kiev. So the, especially the youth were engaged in trauma healing activities through painting, through art. And this is, I believe it was one of the school impacted in one of the other quite impacted in Kiev, where these uh, basically, I, I believe these uh, young people were uh, going to a hard school. Therefore, they were quite uh, upset at the fact that they could not perform the art in the school anymore because the school were destroyed. And so they open up a um, specific area also into museum where dedicating for, uh, for them. So that being said, I try to be as uh, short sure as possible. I also would really like you to undertake a survey that I believe Tarek will put on, uh, on the chat. It's a very basic survey, like six question promise, very simple, because it will be very helpful for me also to find out a little bit more if you believe that actually cultural heritage is an aspect that we should also take into consideration in camp management. I really believe that we should, and I really believe that it will be very useful also collect some more stories coming from all around the world, especially coming from camps or outcome setting. And so then we can share of this experience and we can still working with the community. Thank I you, Veronica. You're right. Thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation and, and some incredibly beautiful pictures throughout your presentation as well. So thank you for that. And there you're aren't welcome. any questions in the chat, but I can see that Earl has his hand up. So I'm going to go straight over to him. So <laughs> yes. Earl, go ahead. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation and a topic that's near and dear. I'm, I'm hopeful that you might know about um, the book that was written by Azar Tiabji on Buj in India. It was a book that really documents a tremendous effort that was made by the people from that area in Gujarat after the earthquake to use the community and the skills. It's a very artsy craftsy place. Everything is done that's just tradition and it's wonderful. And that his book really documents his whole process, which if you've not heard of it, I would highly recommend that um, that, that you do so. It's the book name of the, the title of the book is Buj. Mm -hmm. B-H-U-J, and, and the author is Azar, A-Z-H-A-R, Tiabji, T-Y-A-B-J-I. 
And um, I was part of a team that went in there and Osri and I worked together on this thing. And he really pulled together a wonderful effort that brought back much of the Bougie uh, experience and, and in, uh, in the area of Kutch in, in India, over. Thank you for this. No, unfortunately, I never read about it. But I also read, for example, with ICROM, I was reading a lot of um, exercise and uh, research they have done with um, not only in India, but I think it was also in uh, now in Turkey with the earthquake. So they've been working a lot with the community to create also skills of resilience. They also have been working a lot, uh, as, as I mentioned before, in disaster risk mitigation measure. We also, we, so they've been basically tra training also civil society and they were using the community as well to stabilizing very ancient building. Because sometimes, you know, the time that actually a rescue team go into a place, it might take uh, some, a lo long time. Therefore, there were actually the community where uh, were engaged with this uh, to also stabilizing like uh, buildings, archaeological site. And uh, yeah, they've done a lot. It's, for me, it's been quite a very good experience. The, the course that I have done is, uh, I think it was lasted for six months. It was one month in Rome. And we touch a lot to several points. That is why I believe that there are a lot of areas that are overlapping with humanitarian. We just, I think, is a matter of calling things with a different name or same name. But in reality, we have a lot of similarity. And I believe that there are a lot of, um, I would suggest, like a specific uh, topic that we can explore together and, to, and find a way forward, also between humanitarian and cultural heritage experts. Because nowadays one... it's very important to, sorry, to support the identity also the loss of identity and memories of people. One, one of the other things that, was, that might be of interest is that I was part of the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center in Bangkok, and we carried out a series of training sessions for the museums in the region. It was a regional course that we sponsored with the Getty Foundation. And, and the experiences that we, we carried out were to look for vulnerabilities within museum sites. And, and as protective as the Thai institutional structures are, the director of the museum in Bangkok was very open about allowing us to come in. And we had these exercises where we walked around and identified potential issues that could in fact jeopardize the collections and all the other things that were there. As part of this, we were invited to Istanbul and, and had the, uh, the really tremendous good fortune of going to Tapkapi and to mm -hmm. discuss with the director the mitigation activities, the DRR kinds of things that Top Copy is built on a fault, a fault line, which I don't know, yeah, yeah, maybe you don't know what you're building or where you're building. But anyway, it's <laughs> built on a fault line. And unfortunately, um, the expectations of a major event in Istanbul would put into jeopardy that uh, spectacular museum that's there. But they have already done a whole series of really phenomenal uh, mitigation activities in the exhibits, in how they store things, what they've done to really protect the tangible, the tangible culture, the material culture of a spectacular environment that, that Turkey really represents. Over. Thank you. Thanks, Earl. Thanks Thank for you. those comments. Veronica, I just want to catch you. We have five minutes left because there's some interesting Sorry. things in the chat. No, no problem at all. It's, it's a fascinating topic. We have a couple of people who have shared links to that book that Earl shared. So thanks to that, Earl, at two different but reputable bookstores. Um, a lot of people saying what a fantastic presentation, Veronica. So you should be very proud of that. And there are a couple Thank of you. questions. One is... Um, Asherin would love to know more about the examples that you shared. Is there a report that we could read more on the topics you shared? I can suggest some of them. I okay. can definitely can suggest some of them. And actually the, the reason also of having this, uh, this more survey, we were talking already with Jennifer, if uh, there, there is a time also to collect some of the stories that coming from around the world from the camp specifically of activity that have been done involving cultural heritage. And I believe it will be very valuable also for other CCCM practitioners to have a list of activities because quite often 
we don't know what, what kind of activities we would like to implement and with the community. And I believe that uh, I personally experienced, especially when I was at the very beginning of my CCCM experience, when I started this work, that um, quite often I was doing the same activities because I did not understand how I could integrate also other area. And uh, in reality, I believe there, is, uh, there are so many things that we could do with the community. We just need to maybe brainstorm a little bit and use some examples that are existing already and then share this knowledge also with other practitioners. Yeah, and, and there, there are comments flying into the chat now, Veronica. This, this subject has enlightened people. Um, so I want to turn very quickly to Giovanna, although she's, she's coming on next, she wants to make a very quick comment now. Yeah. So Gio, are you there? Super quickly, Veronica, uh, because we had the, in, the, in the session uh, about the participation accountability, uh, two, three days ago, now I'm a bit lost with time. Uh, there was this point about uh, the need to include more input from uh, anthropology, from social studies, and uh, how this could, uh, you know, enrich uh, or support further, you know, our work with the community. So it would be good then, Veronica, maybe to follow up a bit with um, mm -hmm. the participation uh, working group to see if, um, yeah, there is maybe something um, not too complicated we can, uh, we can do already. No, sure, I will be happy to support in this. Um, and Jennifer's made a, an important point <laughs> about trying to incorporate this into the minimum standards work too. Well, just to compete with Geo, I have to say that the working group of the camp management standards has already kind of taken that idea. And it really, like that frame of mind helped us to really reshape what we were struggling with, with where our lines were between what camp management does and where site planning does. And maybe it just connects back to the previous presentation from our, um, our friends at, at um, USAID in that we were thinking like, what specifically does camp management do that's different than site planners? And we bring in that view of the population and we make that link into what is essential to the population that we must preserve within the site and promote within the site and give agency to the displaced population. And so um, just to, to kind of clarify, that's for IDPs who may not be able to express themselves within their own site. And so I think that, that, that having Veronica on our camp management standards working group really helped to reflect that really, really well. So um, we will share her with you, Gia, but it's, it's really important that we continue to articulate that. And Vero, thank you for the lovely, lovely presentation. Thank you for inviting me to present. <laughs> I'm not sure I need to say any more, Veronica. Just I think you, you've, you've done a fabulous presentation. Everyone's delighted. So well done. And thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Please take the survey. Everybody take the survey. 